Thanks for listening. And if you like the podcast, why not tell a friend or two to take a listen? There's no greater gift you can give a friend than the gift of my story. Or maybe a kidney if they need one. But you've got two kidneys, so is it really that big of a deal to give one of them away? The Time Traveler's Guide to Not Getting Caught. Again. Chapter 33, Part 2. That time my dad and I became Pirates of the Caribbean. All right, thanks for letting me take a taquito break. Although I gotta say, I also used the toilet on our break, and even though I know I didn't need to share that with you, I figured some of you might have been interested, so blame those people and not me. Anyway, we make our way over to Blackbeard's ship, and it pretty much looks like your average pirate ship. You know, like any ordinary one you've seen in movies. So basically just Pirates of the Caribbean and Hook. I mean, first off, it was a total sausage fest. And I don't mean that like when I was in Napoleon times and the French army was cooking up sausages. I mean it like when I was in the Renaissance hanging out with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and they kept showing me their heroes in a half shell. There were more parrots aboard Blackbeard's pirate ship than there were women. And I don't think that should ever be the case in any location. Unless you're in a parrot shop, even then, I don't think that should be the case. And now, I want to take this time to talk a little more about parrots. Not because I'm in any way obsessed with them, but because I felt it was super irresponsible to just allow a bunch of parrots to be aboard a ship. Like if I had a pet parrot, which is risky because all they ever do is judge you for not turning that half orgasm into a full one, I'd be afraid it would fly away and get a little too far from the ship and not be able to get back. Like Blackbeard had two parrots, one for each shoulder, and he did not seem at all concerned that either of them would fly away and then get too tired to make its way back to the ship, and then fall into the ocean and drown. And I'll tell you this, I never once saw anyone clip any of their wings, and so those parrots definitely had the capability of flying away. I mean, sure, somebody could have been clipping their wings when I wasn't watching, but I find that very unlikely. Like in all my time on that ship, I never once met a pirate named Mr. Clippy. Okay. That's everything I'm going to say about parrots, at least for now. So my dad and I are walking around the ship and everyone has a sword and I couldn't help but wonder how many of them accidentally poke themselves or someone else with it and how many self-inflicted sword wounds there were during this time. Like were there people arguing that there should be three day waiting periods to buy swords because they're dangerous? So my dad and I look around the ship and we have no idea what we're supposed to be doing. Like do we have some sort of task? Like should he and I be raising the sails or like manning the oars? Did pirate ships even have oars? Were we allowed to choose our tasks? If we were, then I wanted to work the cannons because they seem like the most fun job. But I wondered if it would be presumptuous to be the new guy on the ship and go straight for the cannons because you probably had to work your way up to get there. I bet the entry level pirate job was mopping the deck and then the first promotion was being a personal assistant to the higher up pirates. And then maybe the next promotion was raising the sails and then Finally, you would get promoted to manning the cannons. But then I realized that there are two different cannon jobs. There are the dudes who load the cannons, and then there are the dudes who light them. And then I figured the guys who are lighting the cannons are probably the higher ups and are the ones who order around the guys who load the cannons. But then I wondered if my dad and I had to start from the bottom, or if we naturally usurped the jobs of the pirates we killed. It was either that or everyone else would get moved up to take over the new positions, like everyone got promoted from within. But if my dad and I took over the position of the pirates we killed, it would be like we were outside hires coming in and taking the good jobs everyone else wanted, and then all the pirates would resent us. But then I realized my dad and I should do what everyone does in life. Fake it until we make it. So I tell my dad I want to man the cannons and he tells me he wants to also. And so I say we should just go down beneath and just find a cannon to stand next to and act like it's our cannon. And my dad thinks it's a good idea. And so we start walking around the ship looking for a way to go below. But let me tell you this about pirate ships. They aren't as easy to navigate as you might think. One moment we're walking starboard and the next moment we're walking whatever the other direction is. Is it soprano? Is that what you call it? Baritone? Were we walking baritone? Anyway. My dad and I are walking around, but we have no idea where we're going and neither of us want to ask for directions because then we'd be given the nickname, he who asked for directions. So after way too long looking, we finally find our way down and now we're searching below deck for the cannons and it's like a labyrinth. But I'll tell you this, there was still more room in the ship than there were in the halls of the Titanic. Plus, we didn't have to look at that terrible wallpaper. 
If you don't understand this reference, then you should go back and re-listen to season one. And so my dad and I are walking around looking for the cannons until finally I spot a cannonball and where there are cannonballs, there are cannons. And sure enough, I spot a cannon, but there aren't any other pirates around. And that's when my dad and I realize that nobody needs to man the cannons until we're in conflict. And then I start to get hungry, but I realize there probably isn't any good food aboard a pirate ship, but we figured we should look around anyway. So we start scouring the ship for some sort of food when we run into a pirate with an eye patch. My first inclination was to pull off the eye patch to see if it was just for show, but I refrained from doing that because my face already hurt a lot from getting punched earlier and I didn't want to cause a scuffle. So I ask eye patch where my dad and I could get some grub. Yes, I use that term. That's when he holds up this stale, moldy piece of bread and offers it to me and my dad. And on one hand, we felt it was a nice gesture for this old eye patch guy to give us some of his food. But on the other hand, that thing looked gross. And I really wasn't hungry enough to resort to eating some old pirate's leftover bread. So instead, my dad and I head back up to the top of the ship, hoping we'd find some sort of fresh fish. And that's when we realized that there must be a fisherman job aboard the ship because we were on the ocean and certainly pirates would be fishing the entire time because why wouldn't they? But when we start looking around the top deck, not only was there nobody fishing, but nobody was even doing that much work. All anyone was doing was drinking rum and singing. And now I'm thinking, well, this seems kind of fun. But I'm also thinking, shouldn't this boat full of grown men be getting to work? And so my dad and I look all around for some fresh grilled fish, but we don't spot any. And that's when we see a couple of fishing poles. And so my dad and I decide to go fishing together. And so we grab the fishing poles and we head off toward an empty part of the ship. And then for the first time in my life, I was fishing with my dad. As my dad and I cast our lines, we realized why none of the pirates were fishing. Because the ship was moving so quickly, it was really difficult holding onto the poles and really didn't seem worth our trouble. And so instead, my dad and I decided to get drunk on rum and dance and sing with the pirates. So we make our way back over to the group and we see a bunch of rum and cups sitting around. So we pour ourselves something to drink and then we start singing. And I'll tell you this, getting drunk with a bunch of men on a rocky ship and singing with them is not a lot of fun. But then we spot a table off by the side of the ship and my dad and I decide to teach everyone how to play beer pong. But we just needed to find a ping pong to play with. But because we were living in the past and we were on a stupid pirate ship, there weren't any. But then I got a great idea. I look over at the eye patch guy and I ask him if I could take a look under his eye patch. And he says, Aye. And so I do. I was expecting him to have some sort of glass eye that we could use to play beer pong with. But instead, there was just a big gaping hole. After I vomited overboard, I ask around if anyone has a glass eye. And then several pirates take out their glass eyes and hand them to me. But now I have way too many glass eyes. So I have to choose which one I want to use. But I feel like I might be hurting some of their feelings if I don't choose their glass eye. So I decide to take the glass eye of the burliest pirate because I certainly didn't want to upset him. So I set up the table and place some cups on it and fill them with rum because that's all we had. And then I explain the game to the pirates. But let me tell you this about trying to explain something to a bunch of dumb, drunken men on a ship. It isn't easy. But if you repeat yourself enough and threaten to kill them all, you'll eventually get it through their heads. So after I explain everything, we were ready to play our first game of beer pong. Or I guess technically it would be called rum pong. And I'll tell you this. My dad and I kicked some pirate ass. Not in the same way we had kicked the asses of the two pirates we wound up shooting several times until they were dead, but in the sense that we defeated them soundly. And then I started wondering if my dad and I should stop all of this time traveling and instead become a couple of professional beer pong players. But then I wondered if we were only good playing rum pong on a moving ship. And then I wondered if we were only good because we were playing a bunch of pirates that were super drunk and had never played the game before. And then I noticed Blackbeard watching us play and I could tell he was happy we killed his two pirates and joined his crew because he wanted a pair of winners. After we finish playing, Blackbeard tells us to join him in his quarters and so we go with him to his room and it is absolutely gigantic. Just titanic. 
And I can say that because I was on the Titanic. And there is a bunch of delicious looking food. And when I say a bunch of food, I mean a bunch. Like a titanic amount of food. There was an entire roasted pig on a pike just sitting in the middle of it all. And I'm thinking how ironic it is that the eye patch guy is resorting to stale bread while Blackbeard has an entire pig in his room. Man, Bernie Sanders would be pissed. I could tell Blackbeard wanted us to comment on the pig, and so I say, Damn, that's a big pig! And Blackbeard smiles and says, Arr! And then he adds to his R and says, Would you like to have the snout? Now look, I'm not condoning all of the bad things Blackbeard's done. And you know, I am no fan of pirates. I mean, I already killed a couple of pirates at this point of time. But the man did offer me the snout. And just like the turkey's beak, everyone knows that the snout is the most coveted part of the pig. So like, sure, he did some terrible things, but he's also a good host if he likes you. And after he offered me the snout, I took out my sword and I sliced the snout off and I took a bite of it. Now... This was the first snout I had ever eaten, and let me tell you this. I don't know why the snout is the most coveted part of a pig, because it didn't taste that good. Sure, it was my first snout, so maybe it just wasn't cooked well, or maybe it had to be seasoned better. I mean, who seasoned the pig? Deborah Franklin? But really, it wasn't just the flavor, it was also the texture. I mean, there were two large holes in it, and I couldn't help but think about all the times that snout was in the mud or sniffing another pig's butt. Do pigs sniff other pigs' butts? I bet they do. Although I'm only betting they do because dogs do it. I figure a pig would just be like a dog. Anyway, I was eating the most coveted part of the pig, and I couldn't just spit it out, but it's all rubbery. And once again, I was forced to swallow something disgusting. I'm talking about you, Deborah Franklin. I glanced over at Blackbeard and I could tell he was concerned I didn't like the snout. So I made an mmm sound so he'd think that I liked it even though I most definitely did not like it. And then Blackbeard turns to my dad and asks him if he'd like some bacon. And my dad says, yes. And now I'm wondering why I get stuck with the snout while my dad gets some prime bacon. So my dad takes out his sword and tries to slice off some bacon, but it's way harder slicing off some bacon with a sword than it is a snout. And to make matters worse, my dad has no clue where bacon comes from, and so he's just carving up this entire pig, and I'm getting nervous Blackbeard is going to call me or my dad a bastard bitch and throw us overboard. But instead, he looks over at my dad and tells him he'll get the bacon for him, and so Blackbeard goes over and cuts him off a piece of bacon, which I thought, was another sign that he was a hospitable host. I know what an inhospitable host looks like. If you can't remember, listen to the Davy Crockett chapter. So my dad takes a bite of the bacon, and he looks like he is in heaven. And now I want to try some bacon, but I don't want to look greedy. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to have any of the delicious bacon at that moment but I knew I'd have another chance because there is no way the pig was going to be completely eaten anytime soon because there was just so much of it. So I figured I'd try to steal a piece or two at some later point. So Blackbeard tells us to take a seat and so we both take a seat because when you're in Blackbeard's quarters on his ship and he tells you to take a seat, then you take a seat. So then Blackbeard tells us he could use a couple of good first mates and at first I'm thinking, well, why are you coming to us to talk about it? Like, do you want us to plan some sort of committee that goes and finds you a couple of good mates? But then, I realized he was insinuating that my dad and I were the people he was looking for. And so I say, Aye, matey! And then Blackbeard looks at me like I wasn't supposed to say that. But instead of slicing me to death with his sword, he tells us that he's going to attack a British ship tomorrow that has a bunch of gold and silver on it. And he wants my dad and me to stay aboard a ship in case any of the soldiers are able to get on. And then Blackbeard looks at me and asks if we'll do it, except it was less of a question and more of an order where if we said no, he would slice us to death right then and there. And I look at him and I tell him that I swear to Jesus, I can say that because I know Jesus, that I will protect his ship from the British. And the answer seemed to please him because he slices off a piece of bacon and throws it at me like I'm some sort of dog begging for a treat. And then I catch it with my hands 
not my teeth because I am a human being. And then I thank him, and then he tells us that he'll give us the second nicest quarters on the ship outside his own. And so I say, thanks so much, Blackbeard, because that's what you say when Blackbeard gives you the second best quarters on his ship. Then one of the lower level pirates shows my dad and me to our quarters, and when we get there, I gotta say, it wasn't as magnificent as Blackbeard's room, but it was still super nice. I mean, it was way better than Alvy's room on the Titanic, and he was in first class. So my dad and I try to get situated in our quarters, but I still have some snout stuck in my teeth and I hadn't brought any floss with me because why would I ever bring floss with me when traveling back to the past? Luckily, the whole ship was made of wood, so I just pulled out a splinter from the wall and used it to get that pesky snout out of my teeth. So even though the quarters were big, there was only one bed in the room, and so my dad and I have to decide if we'll share the bed or if one of us will sleep on the ground. And by one of us, I mean me because I wasn't going to make my dad sleep on the ground. But my dad looks at me and tells me we can share the bed. And so we both get into bed, and now I feel like I reverted back into being a toddler or something, sleeping in bed with my daddy. And even though it was a little weird sleeping with my dad, there was something about it that just felt right. And I think my dad felt it too, because we both fell asleep really quickly. And I hadn't slept that well since I was on the Titanic. And it was at that time that I considered buying a waterbed because there was just something about being on water that made me feel at home. But I never wound up doing it because I totally forgot all about it until just now, and I'm too lazy to go out and buy a new bed. I woke up refreshed the next morning and realized that this was the big day. This was the day that Blackbeard was going to attack the British ship. But my dad and I had to figure out what we were going to do. We didn't want to have to kill any soldiers because it was difficult for us to figure out some sort of justification for it, but we also wanted to impress Blackbeard, and we knew if we killed one or two soldiers that he'd be super impressed. And then if the mission were successful, he'd have to bring what he just stole to his secret treasure hiding place, and then we'd be able to get the Tudes and go back to it in the future and make one of the greatest discoveries of all time. (laughs) And when I say discovery, I mean actual discovery. Not like Isaac Newton just realizing that gravity exists. I mean, we'd be unearthing a long lost treasure and it would help out the world tremendously because, you know, we'd be giving the world a lot of gold and stuff. Yeah, we'd we'd be helping out the world. So my dad and I decide to stay aboard the ship like Blackbeard wants. And if any soldiers come aboard, We just wait and see what we do because neither of us like to plan anything. It's because no matter how foolproof a plan is, things never go according to it. And so my dad and I head out to the deck and we spot Blackbeard standing before the pirates and he's giving an inspirational speech. And I'll say this, it was pretty good. I mean, not as good as mine in 1860 to start a civil war, but it was still top notch. I mean, sure. I didn't understand a lot of the words because he was using a bunch of pirate slang, but I can tell it was powerful because he had all of the pirates riled up and they were all clutching their swords. And that's when I started to think about the sword shop owner, and I realized that he was probably hoping a lot of the pirates lose their swords during the battle, because then he'd get a lot of sales. And then we spot the British ship in the distance, and instead of it being part of a fleet, for some reason, it was by itself. Which, if you ask me... It's pretty stupid to be traveling alone in the Caribbean during the time of pirates. And so Blackbeard points his sword at the ship, and all the pirates are all riled up, but they all have to wait to board the ship because it's still super far away. And then I look over at the rum pong table, and I wondered if we could play a game or two while we were waiting to catch the ship, but it didn't seem like the right move at the time. So, instead of being entertained... We all just kind of stood there in the slowest chase of all time (sighs) until finally, after what felt like forever, we move along the side of the ship and that's when Blackbeard yells for people to man the cannons. And so I look over at my dad all excited because this was the time when we could fire a cannon. And so we start to rush over when suddenly Blackbeard stops us and tells us to stay out on the deck. And part of me was excited that Blackbeard wanted us to stay with him but the other part of me really wanted to fire a cannon. But it wound up being good we didn't go down there because just as we got broadside, is that the right word? To the British ship, they fire a bunch of cannonballs at us and wind up hitting our ship dead on where the cannon operators were. 
And we could hear screaming from down below. And I'm pretty sure several pirates got crushed to death from cannonballs. And it was at that time that I started to question if working the cannons was actually one of the best jobs on the ship. Despite the British ship's best efforts, they barely made a dent in Blackbeard's ship. Then, Blackbeard ordered his men to swing over to the British ship, and per his orders, my dad and I stayed aboard while we watched his crew slaughter the British. And for a moment, I felt a little sad that I wasn't part of the attack. I know it was a terrible thing, and I didn't want to be part of a slaughter per se, but all the pirates were having a good time. And it seemed like it would have been an exhilarating experience just to be part of the team. And then, we see a British soldier swing over to our ship, and I realized that this was the moment. It was the moment where we had to take a side. Do we stay with Blackbeard and kill this soldier? Or do we stick with our moral code? But then, my dad figured out a third solution. He pulled out his gun, but this time, he made sure it was on stun, and he shot the soldier. Except the soldier was standing on the side of the ship, and when he got shot, even though he was only stunned, he wound up falling backwards into the ocean. And I don't just want to go on and assume that my dad accidentally murdered him because I didn't technically see the soldier die, but I also didn't see him resurface after going under the water either. And I don't blame my dad for the soldier's potential death because he wasn't intending on killing him. It was definitely not premeditated murder. If anything, it would just be manslaughter. And if you think about it hard enough, it technically wasn't my dad that killed the soldier. It was technically the ocean that killed him. So I look over at my dad and he gives me a shrug. And so I give him a shrug back. But then we see another soldier swing over and my dad aims his gun and wants to shoot the soldier. But the soldier is hanging onto the side of the ship. And if my dad shot him, the soldier would definitely fall overboard and most likely die because I doubt he could swim back to land and nobody was going to throw over a life preserver. And then another soldier swings over onto Blackbeard's ship and my dad's just standing there with the gun, refusing to shoot until the soldiers actually got completely aboard the ship, when all of a sudden, one of the soldiers gets shot in the head. And then the other soldier gets shot in the head as well. And that's when I see Blackbeard swinging over from the British ship back onto his ship and he's looking at us, and he seems super pissed that my dad did not shoot them. My first thought was, man, Blackbeard's an incredible shot being able to hit them in the head while swinging on a rope. But then my second thought was, shit, he's probably going to shoot us in the head. And then Blackbeard lands on the ship, and my dad and I feel like we're screwed because Blackbeard technically saw us not kill those soldiers, and now he knows that we aren't loyal to him. But then, my dad does something genius. He puts his gun away because he knows there's no way we'd be able to win a shooting contest with Blackbeard. And he figures if he puts his gun away, that Blackbeard would as well. And it turns out that Blackbeard is a noble pirate who believes in a fair fight. I know, it's weird. So then Blackbeard puts his gun away and instead takes out his sword. And so my dad and I take out our swords and we're about to have a sword fight with Blackbeard. But neither my dad nor I had ever been in a sword fight before. The only time I ever used a sword was to cut off a pig's snout, and it was already dead. So there we were, my dad and me in a sword fight against Blackbeard. And no, I'm not going to end the season right now before we have our fight. But you should know that the season is nearing its end. But alas, all good things must come to an end. And so must this season. And so must it end on a cliffhanger. So where was I? That's right, I was back with Ben Franklin. No, no, that's not it. I was in ancient Egypt about to free the Jews. Yeah, that's where I was. So I started crumping in front of the Pharaoh. Wait, no, I was with my dad on Blackbeard's ship. Yeah, that's where I was. So we enter Blackbeard's quarters and there's a huge pig on a pike. Wait, no, I, it was after that. Wait, let me check the tape again. Oh, okay. We were about to have our epic sword fight. And when I say epic, I don't mean it was that epic because neither my dad nor I knew how to fight with the sword. So instead, it was sort of just two men with pointy sticks trying to attack a bearded pirate. The first thing we did was simultaneously lunge towards him with our swords. And I'll say this about Blackbeard. The man was incredibly nimble and was easily able to dodge our attacks. And that's when my dad reaches for his gun because unlike Blackbeard, we are not honorable pirates. 
And let me just say this. It is overrated being honorable when you're traveling through time because if your life's in danger, you've got to do whatever you need to do in order to survive. So when my dad reached for his gun, I thought it was the right move. But Blackbeard apparently was a master swordsman and he swipes at my dad and knocks the gun out of his hand. And then I swipe at Blackbeard with my sword and he blocks me and then he kicks me in the gut and I fall on my back. And now I'm as vulnerable as a turkey on the first Thanksgiving. And then Blackbeard approaches me with his sword and he pushes it against my throat and slides it against my skin super slow to the point where it pierces my skin a bit and a little trickle of blood starts to form. But he doesn't completely cut through because he doesn't want me to die just yet. He wants me to feel the pain of the blade. And then he pulls the sword back and he's about to swipe at me when suddenly I see another sword go right through his stomach. And let me tell you this about seeing a sword go right through someone's stomach. It's pretty exciting, especially when it goes through the stomach of someone who's about to kill you. It's like a gift from Jesus or Moses. I can say that because I know them both. But here's the thing you never see in the movies when someone's lying on the ground as someone standing over them gets stabbed through the stomach. There's a whole lot of blood. Like, I get drenched with blood. Like, a giant hole opened up in Blackbeard's gut. My first thought was, oh my god, this is so cool. But my second thought was, I hope he doesn't have HIV because I'd totally contract it. So then, Blackbeard falls over on his side, and I see my dad standing over him, super proud that he just stabbed Blackbeard through the stomach. And my dad says, man, that was so cool. Hopefully he doesn't have HIV. And I say, I know, right? And then my dad goes to help me up when, apparently, it takes more than stabbing Blackbeard through the stomach to kill him because that bastard bitch was still alive. And from the ground, he swipes at my dad and slices his arm. <sighs> and my dad was totally okay from it. But the problem is, it caused my dad to stumble back and then he fell overboard. I jump to my feet to try to help him, but Blackbeard swipes at me and I try to block the sword with my arm because that's a natural thing to do when Blackbeard strikes at you with a sword, and he winds up hitting my watch. But luckily, the watch saved my hand from getting decapitated. So then I reach into my pocket and I pull out my gun, and I shoot Blackbeard a few times until I was sure he was dead. And I didn't feel bad at all because he had just struck my dad with a sword and tried to kill both of us. So I figured he deserved to get shot a few times. After I killed Blackbeard, I rushed to the side of the ship and I could see my dad floating away. So I look for a life preserver, but I don't see any. And now I'm starting to realize that I really should stop having adventures on boats because they inevitably wind up going poorly. So I shout to my dad to use the time machine and that we'll meet back at my place. And I will never forget what he said next. My dad shouted, I... Love you, son. And then, I swear I saw a few bubbles trickle up from his butt and I figured he let a big one go in the ocean. And then, my dad entered the date and tudes into his watch and the next thing I knew, he was gone. I breathed in a sigh of relief. Does one breathe in sighs of relief or only let them out? And then I realized what a pretty good journey this had actually been. I mean, sure, we didn't find Blackbeard's treasure, but we had brought a ruthless killer to justice by stabbing him in the stomach and then subsequently shooting him several times. And then, for a moment I wondered what the babysitter was doing. But then I quickly stopped thinking about her because I really didn't care that much about her and instead I figured it was probably a good time to leave this hellhole before Blackbeard's crew returned to find out I had murdered him. And so I go to my watch to enter the date in Tudes, but as I do, I realize that the watch got shattered when Blackbeard swiped at me. I clicked whatever I could, but the watch was completely unresponsive. And that was the moment. That was the moment I realized that I was stranded on Blackbeard's ship without any ability to get back to the future. And to make things worse, Blackbeard's pirates start to swing back onto the ship and they notice he's dead. And then they look at me. As if I was the one who murdered him. I mean, sure, I did technically murder him, but I'd like the benefit of the doubt at least, you know? Like there are a bunch of soldiers that could have murdered him. And then the pirates pull out their swords and I figure, well, guess it's better I get killed now than having to live the rest of my life in this miserable time. 
But instead of slicing me to death or shooting me to death or doing anything to death to me, the pirates start shouting. And then Eyepatch comes up to me and raises my arm in the air like I just won a WWE match or something. And that's the moment that I realized that I was the new captain of the ship. And that's also the moment I knew I would finally discover Blackbeard's treasure. Or should I say, my treasure. <laughs> and then all the pirates go silent as they look at me and want me to say something. And so I look out at all of my faithful followers and I say, fuck! Okay, so I thought about it, and it is in fact a big deal to give away one of your kidneys. Regardless, thanks for telling your friends about the show. Just know that your love makes me feel as good as Socrates' warm, supple lips. Well, almost as good. <laughs>